praise God. It is time to get into the Word this morning, and this is going to be part number four of the sermon series entitled, What on Earth Are You Doing for Heaven's Sake? What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven for moths and rust cannot destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Let us pray. Lord, this is your word. We ask that you would speak to us today. May we hear. May the Holy Spirit open our ears that we may hear what he is saying unto the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, part three, we actually looked at the first three things wrapped up in verse number 19. Ourselves, our treasures, and the place we dwell, the earth. Today we want to look at verse number 20 there where he says, Again, your treasures. We see ourselves there. So aren't you glad that there's going to be a transferring and a translation of our being to eternity? Amen? Many people read through this. I don't think they even grasp the concepts, the principles, the precepts that are locked up here that Jesus is identifying our existence of earth and our existence of heaven and the reality of both and how the earthly existence correlates with the heavenly existence and how they relate one to another, particularly when it comes to the things we now see, the things we now hear, the things we smell, taste, and touch, the sensualities of life, and letting go of the things we can't hold on to, but knowing there's coming a day when the eternal things will come to be. So we see again today, we see ourselves, the believers, let me just say, the only ones who will get to see the reward of heaven are the believers. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will not go to heaven. Let me say it again, you will not go to heaven. And not everybody goes to heaven. It's amazing today how many funerals are held and how many people die and go to heaven at them. I've never been to a funeral where somebody went to hell. But I must say to you that the Bible tells us that there are more going to hell than going to heaven. Now, let me say, as a note on that point, that doesn't give me pleasure to say that. In fact, it breaks my heart. It breaks God's heart. God has provided means and a way to be saved. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible tells us that it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The great golden text of Scripture, John 3, 16, it universally is understood by believers, Christ's followers. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The greatest gift ever given was Christ. But the most unopened gift ever given is Christ. Have you ever thought of it like that? Something as lavish as, as Christ himself, given for us, to us, eternal life, yet remaining unpossessed, unopened as the gift of God. What a travesty. What a tragedy. Utter travesty. Utter tragedy. But we see the believers will have an eternal place of safekeeping for all of eternal future. Can I hear an Amen. On that. Now, let me ask you a couple questions. And I want you to be interactive with me. That means I want you to respond in physical reaction, not by uh, misbehavior, but in appropriate manner. I want you to respond to these questions. So I know sometimes when a preacher asks questions, it's more about introspection. But I want you to respond here with action, okay? Who among us wants to die? Okay, I'm glad no one raised their hands. Now, if somebody raised their hands, we could say, 
Biblically speaking, in Philippians 1, when Paul said, For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And so if the, there was someone who would say, I want to die, it would only be under those biblical understandings. But no one physically wants to die, do we? None of us naturally want to die. We were born to live. It is unnatural to want to die. Now, I'm sure there have been times in your life where the temptation, perhaps even of suicide, has come across your mind. Because it would be easier, it would seem, in that moment, to give a permanent answer to a temporary problem. At least that's what the enemy would like for us to think. But let me say to you, a permanent answer to a temporary problem is not the answer. Christ has been with you all along the way. If you've trusted him, he's with you now. And he will take care of you today, tomorrow, and forever. Can you accept that today and let that be a reality? Now, the second question I want to ask you, who among us wants to live? And if you didn't raise your hand on that, you must not have heard what I said. You must be sitting back there just thinking about lunch. But even when somebody's caught up in lunch, if I'd ask who wants a burrito, they probably would have, you know. But who wants to live? All of us. Thank you for reacting on that. How many of you believe in life after death? Well, it's a, I'm always amazed how many people are. You know, I'm going. If I ask how many believe in life after death, you ought to go. It ought to be a spastic action, you know. It ought to be reactionary, involuntary, you know, if you're a child of God. It's indicative of you being here because if you didn't believe in life after death, you wouldn't be in church. What would be the point of sitting in a, on a church pew or chair or wherever it may be if you didn't believe that life is beyond the grave? Paul made that very clear exclamation in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if our hope only is in Christ in this life, we're to be pitied above all men. Most miserable, the King James says. Why? Because our faith takes us beyond the current world. It gives us hope beyond the current ex existence and the current experience. And aren't you glad that there is life beyond this current world? Now, how many of you have ever attended a funeral that didn't believe in life after death? You see what I'm saying? Now, there may have been somebody who had a memorial that was an atheist, but I'm going to tell you, can you imagine attending a memorial service for an atheist? Well, we know they went nowhere. We know that their life no longer matters. And we know that their memory will fade into oblivion. And we know that there's no hope beyond this world, and that's just it. And today we've remembered such and such that was born this day and died this day, and that's it. Let's go home. How do you prepare a eulogy for somebody that you can't even remember that's going to be alive again? How can you even give comfort to a family in times like that? How can you have any hope whatsoever at a funeral service if you don't believe in life after death? Why do you even want to bury somebody and have a place of memorial if you don't have something else to look forward to. Because if all that matters, then hey, you live, you die, huh, so what, you know. Then, hey, they died. Roll them over in a ditch and just cover them up, you know. It, life, life takes all, it takes, it takes away all of the sanctity, all of the dignity, all of the beauty of life away when you don't believe in life after death. It removes its entire significance. So what Jesus is talking about here is so much more than just about things. It's about life the way he intended it to be. And we need to understand this mystery. How many of you believe in heaven? Let me see your hands. Now, how many of those that raised your hands believed in hell? Now, let me just tell you, if you believe in heaven, you have to, by default, believe in hell also. When somebody says they believe in life after death, it's amazing how many people will only say, well, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. So in other words, you're choosing what to believe in, but you 
don't want to accept the reality that if you believe in the heaven, there has to be a corresponding hell because if you acknowledge the reality of good, you also have to acknowledge the reality of evil. Right? So even simple reason and logic, and I love to use these kind of arguments when I'm dealing with people that are agnostic or people that are unbelievers or people that are trying to grapple with eternity, and I love to talk about stuff like this with people because I think you cannot say you believe in heaven if you don't believe in hell. You can't say you believe in good if you don't believe in evil. You have to believe in both. There is a heaven and there is a hell, and Jesus taught about both. In fact, he said about hell, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and it is outer darkness, and is the place of the damned, the condemned. But he came that we wouldn't have to go there because the Bible said hell was made for the devil and his angels, and so God doesn't want us to go there, but yet so many of us are spending our time, spending our wheels, chasing things that don't matter, wasting our days, wasting our time, squandering our resources on stuff and things that do not matter. That's what Jesus is talking about. If you understand what real life is, it focuses you on what matters. And it puts things in priority and in perspective, and it brings principle to the place of your person. Now, we also see the treasures here. I'm glad, thank God, there's not, even, not just only uh, hope for the believer for eternal life, but we see also in verse 20, treasures in heaven. Aren't you glad that there are going to be treasures in heaven? I mean, you know, Jesus wouldn't have said this if it wasn't true. Jesus doesn't use exaggerations. Jesus doesn't use anything that's a lie. He tells the absolute truth. These treasures are transferred reward, transferred position, transferred possessions that we have laid up on the other side. Now, the reward of heaven itself getting there to the place is all about Jesus. Amen. You don't get there any other way. None of us can meritoriously earn our way to heaven. We cannot do anything to save ourselves. But Jesus Christ can and has saved us if we have trusted in him as our Lord and Savior. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know. I love that imperative word. I love that emphatic, the emphatic definition and nature of that imperative word, know. In my knower, I know that I know. Amen? That means I have confidence in my faith that gives me certainty and gives me absolute assurance that I'm saved. Amen? Somebody says, are you saved? Well, I hope so. And I'm thinking, oh, what? What? Y y you hope so? I'd be like, are you married? I hope so. <laughs> you got a job? I hope so. You know, and, I'm, and the reason I'm saying that, if you are employed, you know you have a job. If you are married, you know you're married. Right? You got a home? I hope so. If you have a home... You, yeah, I got a home. I live at such and such address. Well, we are citizens of heaven. We know the address. Can I hear an amen? It's in eternity. We know Christ, and so we know eternal life. So what he's talking about in the treasure has to do with the transfer of reward, position, and possessions. I'm so glad that how I live here is going to directly impact the treasure over there because God wants me to understand the only reason that when we got saved, he didn't just go ahead and say, beam me up, Scotty. Uh, and take us on to heaven is because he's got work for us to do here. And as we serve, according to the abilities he gives us, according to Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, also a corresponding one in the book of Luke, I believe it's chapter 12, where he talks about the master giving certain amounts of money to his servants, and they were to serve, and he would reckon with them when he returned. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to do for us. And the ones that did well will receive more than what they were given. Amen? Because there is the power of spiritual exponentiation. What does that mean? How I live in the natural can exponentiate in the spiritual. Oh, can, did you hear? Some of you ain't getting this. How I live in the natural can exponentiate 
in the spiritual. In other words, we reap what we sow. But remember something about the sowing process. If you sow a watermelon seed, you get a whole lot more seeds back than one. If you get one watermelon, you're going to have a buku of seeds just in one watermelon. So the exponentiation factor is locked up in how we sow in the natural to reap the spiritual. But I want to say this is not spiritualizing the possessions. They're going to be literal, natural, physical, touchable, seeable, handleable things, tangible things that we're going to experience in heaven. Our experience in heaven is not going to be ethereal. It's not going to be some disembodied spirit type of existence where we're just going to have this mindset. No, this is going to be a real physical existence that God's going to let us enjoy, but it's going to be without the things of Satan, sin, sorrow, sickness, or suffering. All that's going to be gone. Hallelujah. Now, the third thing we see in this text, he says, in heaven. Heaven, then, is the eternal destination for every child of God that's truly born again. Not some churchgoer, not some religious guy. There will be people in heaven that didn't necessarily go to church because when they got saved, maybe they didn't have an opportunity to be discipled and learn. But Christ knew them and he knows them. And there will be people sitting on church pews that are going to go to hell because they weren't born again. There will be pastors who will go to hell all because they had a they had a particular degree in theology or they were hired on in a position, but they didn't know Christ. Let me just say to you, sitting on a church pew doesn't guarantee your salvation. But I want to say if you are a child of God, you ought to be sitting on a church pew. Can I hear another amen? Now, some of you didn't say amen on that one. I say as a pastor, I can't say an amen enough on that because every baby needs a family. Once the baby's born, you don't say, okay, you're on your own now. No, a baby needs a place of provision. A baby needs a place of protection. A baby needs a place of principle. A baby needs a place of promotion. A baby needs a place of instruction, correction, direction. It needs all of these things. Every child of God needs a family to belong to. It's called the church. Now, let us move on quickly here. We see three things absent here that were present in earth. Go back to verse 19 there. Do not store up... Tr- Treasures here on earth where malls, where present, these things happen. Eat them, rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Now, how many of you have had cars that have now gone to be with the Lord? No, no I'm just kidding. That have, that <laughs> if it was, it was a Chevrolet, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, how, many, how many of you have had cars that over time just gave up the ghost and you had to turn it over to the salvage yard or trade it in or something? Now, we know then no matter how new something is right now, it's going to get old. Because of thermodynamics and the breakdown of things in life, the natural processes of decomposition take place, correct? How many of you don't look as good as you did 20 years ago? Some of you say you speak for yourself, preacher. (laughs) Degeneration and decomposition is taking place naturally within. The the sooner you learn that, the better off you are. Some of you probably today were glad to be at church, but you're not necessarily moving quite as well after yesterday's reception. I'm just kidding. (laughs) And if you were here yesterday, you'd understand because on the dance floor they were having a good time in the Lord. Even my own mom got up and did did a little bit of the twist yesterday. They said, look at you, mama. I said, I know, I know. But it's good, and I sat there, you know, I felt like Jesus was smiling because we were having jubilation. And I can't wait for the day when God's people are going to be gathered in that place of utter euphoria, utopia, and jubilation before God, and we're going to dance before Him in absolute pleasure of the King. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And I can't wait when we're not going to have to say, see, uh, see, uh, or goodbye, and then we're going to say, hey, see y'all guys later, okay? We'll come back and do this again soon, maybe tomorrow, you know? But he says, and where thieves don't break in is there. I mean, have you ever had anything stolen from you? Even if it was a $5 bill, if it was your purse, if it was your ID, if it was your identity, whatever it may be. And I I tell people in life, one thing I can't stand is a thief. And and I I love people, but I just, it makes you feel violated and victimized, doesn't it? It's, it's, It's a material raping of sorts, isn't it? You've, you've stepped into somebody's space you don't belong in. And God has 
structured civil law within his word for mankind to abide within socially and civilly. Amen? We thank God for the laws we have. And the Bible should be the basis of all those laws. Now, but we notice all three of these things are going to be absent in verse 20. Store your treasures. He says, don't store on earth. Now, do store. If you could put the word do in front of store there, it would help understand the context. Do store your treasures. So Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to have something, but put it in the right place. I want you to be blessed. And then we have all these prosperity preachers out here that think it's just about now. And they think, oh, you're little gods and you're supposed to have everything now. Paul said, I've suffered the loss of everything and do count it but dung that I might know Jesus. I'd like for some of these prosperity preachers to start living like Paul and see if they'd keep preaching like he did. I don't think many of them would last because they don't know how to live without all the lavish. But Paul said, I've learned at whatever state that I'm in to be there with content for contentment with godliness is great gain. For it's certain we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out of it. It's amazing how they pull things out of context and try to apply it. If you're going to do anything biblically, let it be biblically balanced and rightly divided. Don't you just pull it out for your own personal use. But he says, store your treasures in heaven. In other words, I want you to understand that the best financier, the best financial advisor that's ever been is Jesus. Amen? How many of you would like to trust your financial portfolio and your future eternal spiritual portfolio into the hands of Jesus? Let me see your hands. All right, there you go. So you can have the most well-reputationed financial guy from Edward Jones look over your financial portfolio and make advisements according to your uh, best indicators of the stock market of where to put your monies. But that doesn't mean that things can't change on a dime, right? How many of you have ever invested and lost money quickly in the stock market? Anybody? All I say, if you were around 2007, 2008, you felt the sting of that, didn't you? Now, but if you wait over time, and that's the thing, it can regain. And boy, I'm going to tell you, it's been soaring to record lately, hasn't it? But I just want to say this. No matter how high this world gets, it's still unstable, always will be. But the one place you can store your treasures that will always be eternally stable and will always give the highest yield is in heaven. Amen? Store your treasures in heaven where moths cannot and rust cannot. Moths won't be there. They're not going to destroy your garments. Rust is not going to get on things that are metal and destroy them. You can, you can, at a factory, get some raw steel made, set it out on the yard, and before the night's through, it started rusting. All it's got to do is have a little dew touch it, and it's got rust on it. That's why even Danny Rosser, a friend of ours, and some of you know him, a uh, good brother, he rebuilds engines, and he's a Ford man, by the way. I just want to put that in there. Smart man. But anyway, he, uh, he rebuilds the engine. And when he bores those cylinders out on those engine blocks, if you do not spray them with an anti-corrosive material, it will rust. And so you have to spray it to keep it from rusting. Because you don't want that rust in the cylinders when you go to put the piston and you go to put the rings in the cylinder. Anybody know what I'm talking about in rebuilding engines? Okay, if you don't, just trust me on that one, okay? All right, here we go. So malls aren't going to be there, rust aren't going to be there, and thank God thieves will no longer be available. Amen? Nobody's ever going to take what is rightfully yours because it is yours eternally. Can I hear an amen? Everybody's going to know what it is to respect other people's things because they will all have the heart of God. We will live in the house of God, that is the earth, and he will be the temple of it, and we will worship the Lord for everyone will know the Lord. Amen? And wherever your treasure is then, there's where your heart's going to be. In other words, let me put this in a little bit better effect, or not better, excuse me, a little bit clearer understanding of you. Where your treasure is, there's going to be where your focus is. That's where your action's going to be. There's where your life is going to be consumed. That's where you're going to put your efforts. Where are your efforts right now? Let's talk about a few things. The average human being lives between 28,000 to 29,000 days on earth. That comes up to equal about 78.6 years in America. Some of you are saying, man, I'm living on borrowed time. Never mind. (laughs) 
The average American person lives about 78.6 years, that is, on average. Men, get this. Yours is a little less than that. This is the average between men and women. Men, you live about 76.1 years. Women, I got good news. You outlive men by the average of five years. The average lifespan of a woman is 81.1 years. And the ladies say, hallelujah. So in other words, men, they're saying, make sure you got your house in order so when I'm left behind after you. <laughs> oh, come on. That I can live and enjoy myself and still go buy my new shoes. Never mind. Globally, globally, the average it, uh, age of a person in developed nations, not undeveloped, but in the developed civilized nations of the world we call civilized. It's amazing how we use that word. 80.3 years is the average. And so about a year and a half difference between the world and the United States. All right? Now let's ask a couple more questions. How long do you have to live? How many of you know exactly when you're going to die? Let me see your hand. Unless you're Dr. Kevorkian, you don't know that date, right? Oh, come on. When you talk about euthanasia, I thought you were talking about kids overseas, you know, but never mind. Come on. <laughs> euthanasia is when you assist somebody in suicide and kill them because they want to die. That's Dr. Kevorkian, okay? Now, I don't believe in all that. I just don't. There's a distinct difference between making good do not resuscitate decisions at the end of a life when somebody has a living will and you understand that clearly. Then somebody who's saying, okay, you got cancer, you're 35, you don't know if you're going to make it, you want to die, okay, here you go, we're going to help you. I mean, no, that's to me immoral. Amen? Only God holds the life of a person in their hands, in his hands. All right. Now, with that being said, how long do you have to live? And if you don't know, when you're going to die and you've had, you haven't received a notice in the mail that says, I'm coming on this day at this time and here's how you're going to die, then let me ask you this question. How much time, how much effort have you put into thinking about that very thing? Oh, you spent plenty of time thinking about how you're going to get that new car and how you can afford it or how you're going to do this or how you're going to do that, but you haven't thought one iota how I'm going to pay for my funeral and if my funeral comes today or tomorrow, what I, who I want to officiate it, do I have the finances enough to pay for a funeral? Well, my family have to scramble to even pay 900 bucks to get a cremation done. And what kind of legacy will I leave? And what kind of example will I have given? And what would I do different today if I knew I was going to die tomorrow? Well, I've got a, an answer for all that. Live for Jesus to the utmost every day of your life. And have your, uh, your affairs in order under his lordship and everything will be just fine. Can I hear an amen? Because if you live for him and you do it his way, you will have your house in order. Now that doesn't mean that just because you go to church call yourself a Christian, you're going to have all of your financial things in order. It's time for you to get it in order. And I'm going to say this to you lovingly, gently, but truthfully. Most people that die do not have their affairs in order. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? I'm telling you as a pastor from this side of the desk, most of you don't have your finances in order. Most of you don't have your funeral arrangements made. Most of you don't even have enough adequate life insurance or savings to pay for a funeral. And you're going to create issues for your family. And not only that, more importantly, most of you aren't living the way you should be living in Christ. Yes, you love him, but you really don't have him as top priority in all of your ways. Now it's getting quiet. So how long are you going to live? And if you're going to live even 30 years from now, oh, I'm going to live real good, and then what about the last two or three years, I'll get everything. No, no, no. You need to give Jesus your best years. Don't give him with the leftovers. How many of you appreciate getting invited over to dinner somewhere and say, oh, we've already ate, here are the leftovers. <laughs> how many of you do that to God? You invite Jesus into your life, and then you just go in and go and just spend your life eating the way you want to, that is, spiritually, physically, whatever. And then at the end of it, say, oh, here, Jesus, if you don't mind, can you take my leftovers? Yeah. 
Maybe you've never thought of it like that, but it's time you start thinking of it like that. Every day you ought to live like that. A wise man will know to live his life ready at any moment for the call of God. Number two, what am I going to do with my life if I know that I'm going to die, and if I know there's a heaven, if I know there's a hell, and if I know that Christ is going to hold me accountable for what I'm doing, what am I going to do with my life? Am I going to spend it on myself? Am I going to find myself involved in the kingdom, serving in the church very well because it's the family of God? Am I going to rub shoulders with godly people, develop my character, grow in grace, the knowledge of Christ? Am I going to learn how to give rather than receive? Am I going to be a blessing rather than just trying to want, 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 want? Am I going to learn to be someone that will exemplify Christ to the world? And if I died right now, what would I do different than what I've been doing or what I'm currently doing? If you knew you were going to die within 24 hours, what would you be scrambling to get in order? Could you even find your life insurance policy? Furthermore, do you even know, and more importantly, that you're saved? Let me hit you with a couple of quick things. I might have to move quickly here. I want to bring this down. I want you to go with me in a couple of scriptures. Before we go to this, I want to share with you that seven, excuse me, 25 years ago, people lived seven years shorter than they do today. Did you know that? But no matter how many times we add that up, 25, we add another seven years every 25 years, it'd take a long time before we have to get, get to be eternal life, right? Okay, now let's move on. In James chapter 4, Verse 13, look who, you, here, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go to town, stay there a year, we're going to do business there and make a profit. How many of you are always about, oh, i got to make a money, i got to make some money, i got to make some money, got to make some money, got to make a living, you know, got to chase it. And people say, preach, I'm sorry, I ain't been at church, I've been trying to make a living. You're making a living, but you're not living. <laughs> you're, chasing a, you're chasing a living, but you're not living. How do you know that your life will be, will be like tomorrow? What do you, how, how do you know your life, or what do you know your life's going to be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and it's gone. It may be a reality, but it doesn't remain. Now let's go to James 5, verses 1 to 3. Look here, you rich people. Now, some of you say, well, I'm not rich. Let me qualify something here. If you live in America, you're richer than most of the world. In fact, the poorest among us is richer than, uh, than 80% of the world. Did you know that? If you make $700 a month, you are in the top 21% of the richest people on earth. Look you, here, you rich people. And he's talking, I believe, very clearly here to America. Because America has been the richest nation in the history of the world that is financially back in the 90s in a book called The Coming Revival by B, uh, Dr. Bill Bright, he said in the book, who's going on to be with Jesus now, he said America possessed 51% of the world's wealth. Can you imagine that? Weep and groan with anguish because of the terrible troubles ahead of you. You know why? Your wealth is rotting away. Are you hearing the word of God? Your stuff doesn't matter. Infomercials on every network drives me nuts. How about you? Call right now. Within in the next fifteen minutes, you know, and I'm like, oh, this hyperbole just oh. makes me want to get on Netflix. Anyway, get rid of these commercials. Weep and groan with anguish because of the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away. Your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags now they may not literally be but figuratively and spiritually if your dependence is in the things of this earth the moth is eating them up and you don't even know it your gold and silver have become worthless there's no value in what you think your life is measured by the very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like 
fire. What's the rich man going to do on the day of judgment? Listen to me, house of God. Listen to me, people of God. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, Jesus gives the story of the rich man and the beggar. The rich man fared sumptuously every day. And it came to pass that he died, and he lifted his eyes in hell, being in torment. But it came to pass that the beggar died, and the Bible said he was escorted, carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man said, Send Lazarus, that he may dip his finger in water, and he may cool my parching tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Listen to me. If you're pursuing the almighty dollar and the things of life, and you're not putting Christ first, you are wasting your time, and all this stuff in the end won't matter, and you will look back in regret, and you will wish you would have lived for heaven instead of earth. Now, I enjoy things of life. How about you? When we get done with, with service today, Lord willing, I plan on going by His grace to have a good meal. How about you? The rest of you are just going to fast today, I guess. Uh, thank you. I'm planning on eating a good meal. And I don't know about you, but when I sit down and I order my meal, I'm thankful that it's available. I enjoy being able to go to my refrigerator, and if I want to pour me a cold glass of great Kool-Aid, and then open my Mountain Dew and spike it a little bit. Listen, I, that's my kind of spike. I'm just, okay. Okay, that's the worst thing I do. I spike my Kool-Aid with Mountain Dew. You ought to try it sometime. You get it about two-thirds of the way full of great Kool-Aid, pour the rest of Mountain Dew, and you go, I think to myself, I need to get a hold of Tim. We need to have a taste test here and see if this will meet the qualifications to maybe go into mass production. <laughs> here we go. Your gold and silver will become worthless. The very wealth you're counting on that you're sitting back, oh, we're going to live good for the next 20 years. We got a lot of money saved up in the stock market and our savings account. All it takes is one moment to lose it all. This treasure you've accumulated will stand as evidence against you. On the day of judgment. How's he going to do that? Because you pursued the money, the stuff, but you didn't invest the money and the stuff in the heavenly eternal kingdom, and now it's going to stand against you as a testimony that you lived for the wrong things. I don't know about you, but that is sobering to me. In Psalm chapter 90, we understand that our lives are very brief. How many of you believe your life's brief? Let me see your hands. Seventy years are given to us. Some of you are going, okay, now, okay, we're at preacher, I'm, I'm over that threshold. Some of you say, oh, 70 years, that's 50 years from now. It'll come faster than you think. But some even live to 80. Some of you saying, preacher, I'm beyond that, so... But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Young people, I know you have these fantasies. Oh, I'm going to grow up. Ladies, I'm going to marry my knight in shining armor. He's going to throw me up on the back of his horse, and we're going to ride, run, ride off into the great blue beyond and live happily ever after. <laughs> okay, stop a moment. It's, it's great. I love the romanticism of a wedding. I tell him, soak it up. I love the beauty of romance, and I tell them either you're a hopeless romantic or you're just plumb hopeless, okay, when it comes to relationships. Romance is a beautiful thing that God has given us, but here's the thing. It's not going to be as rosy as you think in your own mind, is it? Can anybody that's adults here, if you agree with that, can you just raise your hand and let everybody that's young, see, see, that many people can't be wrong, okay, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> he says and trouble so they soon disappear your days are going to be whew, gone how many of you got older now and you look back and say where have all these years gone how many of you now beginning to think about oh man I got to check in shortly at the gates of eternity and man <laughs> how many of you think about that a lot more now than you used to when you get about 50 plus you're going to think about it a lot okay 
when I'm in, and one advantage I have in ministry is I get to view death a lot. If you work as a fireman, first responder, medical field, you see death a lot. Some people don't see that a lot, but I'm going to tell you, when you live in the midst of death, it makes you understand life in better clarity. And we fly away. We feel like, man, well, these years have just flown by. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. All of a sudden you think, man, there's sarcasm and cynicism about life. It's not as beautiful as it used to be. Oh, to be young again, but hold on. Our lives are brief. Secondly, our opportunities are fading. And we're bringing this down, so hold on. In Ephesians chapter 5, our opportunities are fading. What do we need to do? Live carefully. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Carefully determine what pleases God. How many of you, every day you get up, think about carefully how your day's going to shape up and how it involves you serving Christ? No, your schedule shouldn't just be a schedule. I hate, um, can I just be honest? I think American lifestyle is killing us. As I alluded to in one of my recent devotions, when I went to Haiti, it's a totally different world down there. They don't have schedules to keep. They make their own schedules to go. <laughs> and in some way, it's relaxing. It's refreshing because we, we have these agendas and we have itineraries. I mean, I tell people, don't you take me on a vacation where I have an itinerary. I don't want an itinerary when I'm on vacation. I want to do nothing on vacation if that's what I want to do is nothing. Amen? Some people have a vacation itinerary. Well, at 8 o'clock we eat breakfast. At 8.30 we go here. At 9 o'clock we go. I'm going, no! No! If you're that OCD and that's kind of itinerary, enjoy yourself. I'll be here when you get back. Give me a hammock or let me sit on the porch. Let me just watch the waves roll in. Oh, amen. Go wiggle my toes down in the sand and throw a rod out and wait for them. Yeah, amen. So carefully what deter determine what pleases God. Now, secondly here, in chapter verse 15 of this same chapter, pay attention. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. How many of you are living like fools right now? Now you say, well, preacher, I don't live like a fool. Well, if you're living for the wrong reason, you're living like a fool. But like those who are wise, wise men still look for Jesus in every way. Amen. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Paul, listen, this guy is bent on doing one thing, preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth because that's the reason he was born, his call and anointing from God, and he wanted to finish well, and he gave his head at Nero's chopping block. He lived well, and that's why he could say at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, in other words, that may be behind me, but here's what's ahead of me. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. And then he goes on, and not to me only, but to all them also who love his appearing. And if you want the note, that's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So make the most of every opportunity. How many of you are making the most of every opportunity? How many of you ever met somebody that's such a salesman, they'd sell an igloo to a, I mean, excuse me, they'd sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? I met some people like that. <laughs> make the most of every opportunity in these evil days don't act thoughtlessly Americans have gotten into the habit pay attention to this of thinking thoughtlessly none of these young people seem today be con uh, are concerned about morals values principles it's all about feel good what I want to do what makes me happy kind of lifestyle and it's invaded the pulpits in the churches, in our government. Now we got people wanting socialism and throwing out the Constitution. Anybody want to say anything about that? Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do, not what Curtis wants to do, not what you want to do, but what God has put you here to do. 
If you want to live, oh, but I want to live it up. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Listen to me, friend. I submit to you that you're not really living until you're under his loving lordship. Can I hear an amen? Because every day, listen to me, every day when I'm walking under his lordship, no matter where I'm in. I, I, I was driving the other day down to Laurenburg. Went on, I went to Laurenburg to, for the funeral the, the other day. And on my way down through Hope County there on 15501 and all the way down into Scotland, it was a brilliant, bright, beautiful day. One of the ladies in church said, were you by yourself? I said, no, the Lord was with me. <laughs> and we just, I'm driving right along and I'm going, whoo, this is good. This is refreshing. This is rejuvenation. This is revival. Why? Because I'm looking around at all this open land and all these trees. And it's a beautiful blue sky day. And I'm going, Lord, I'm soaking it up. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Because you see, I can enjoy a drive down the street. You know why? Because I'm living it up for Jesus. Amen. And although I was on my way to a funeral, I knew the author of life. And he says, don't be drunk with wine, so don't get involved in dissipation. Don't get involved in debauchery. Don't live in a stupid manner, in other words. People out here living, everybody's working for the weekend, right? No. Because that will ruin your life. Let me just say something to you, young people. Stay away from alcohol. It'll rot your brain, ruin your body dishonor God and destroy your character amen somebody says oh but you can be a social <laughs> okay go ahead and give somebody some temptation now the reason I'm a teetotaler and stay away from it I've seen what it does to family my uncle used to come to our house when I was a kid just slobbering drunk and just <laughs> all over the table and I'm glad at that young age, I said, I don't want to be like that when I grow up. Amen? He used to come and he'd say, come on out here. Oh, I, 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 I. He wanted to fight my dad, you know? It makes him want to. And they, now, some of you know what I'm talking about. But I'm glad, thank God, I don't have to hug a toilet in the morning or at night. Amen. Hallelujah. I come home and hug my wife or my kids. All right, now let's move quickly. Singing psalms and hymns. So guess what? Get the right kind of music in your head and sing the right kind of lyrics and do the right thing and live a moral life. Can I hear an amen? Don't be whiskey bent and hell bound. Be heaven bent and kingdom bound. Can I hear an amen? Drunk on the Holy Spirit. Amen. People may think you're weird. But at least you'd be happy. <laughs> Let them think I'm weird. I'm fine with that, okay? See, singing psalms, singing spiritual songs among, keep going there, yourselves, God's people, making music to the Lord in your hearts. Amen. If you sing the wrong lyric, hang out with the wrong people, you're going to have the wrong attitude, the wrong character, receive the wrong destination, and lo lose eternal reward. Give thanks to God, for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do everything you do for Christ. Colossians 3, 17 says that. Now let's move, move on. We've got two more points in closing. Not only are our lives brief, not only do we need to make every opportunity count, but number three, our mortal bodies are dying. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Just each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. I don't think I gave you guys 2 Corinthians 4, or did I? 2 Corinthians 4? Okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, that while we're in this earthly body, and although they're perishing, our outward man is perishing, the inward man is renewed day by day. For we don't look at what we can see. There you go. We never give up. Though our bodies are dying. How many of you know you're dying right now? Never give up. Our spirits are being renewed every day for our present troubles. I like this. Are small and won't last very long. Earth is temporary. Heaven, eternal. Yet they produce for us a glory. What's glory? The future anticipation of translation, of transferring, amen, that will vastly outweighs them and will last 
forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Let me roll on into chapter 5 there quickly. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down. <laughs> I like the way he calls it a tent. You're living in a tent. You know that? It's called your body. The tabernacle was a temporary existence. It's a type of symbol of life, a temporary existence of God, right? The, temp the temple is a type of a permanent dwelling, but the permanent dwelling is Christ with us in New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, okay? The eternal heaven. We know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven. Without a mortgage. Amen. <laughs> An eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Talking about a good architect. Talking about a good engineer. Talking about a good builder. You got him. Amen. His name's Jesus. We grow weary in our present bodies. How many of you say amen to that? Your back goes out more than you do. Your knees just don't want to work anymore. We long to put on the heavenly bodies like new clothing. How many of you say amen to that? I want to just change, Lord. If you don't mind, can you get me a new wardrobe here? We will not be spirits without bodies. There won't be a disembodied experience in the new heaven. It's going to be a literal, physical, natural existence. Amen. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. How many of you go, oh, amen to that? But it's not that we want to die and get rid of our bodies. None of us want to die. Rather, we want to put on new bodies. That's why Botox is so popular, right? We want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. Yes, man, the Bible makes all... I'm thinking to myself... Why does a sinner man not see this as blessing? How can he see this as anything less than God? For God himself has prepared us for this. <laughs> yeah, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're going to taste of heaven on earth, amen. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Ah, wait a minute. Faith, not what we can touch, what we can't see, what we can't touch. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we, we will be at home with the Lord. How many of you are looking forward to that day? Now, if put all these pieces together that we've talked about so far, isn't it framing up something beautiful and eternal for us? So whether we're here in this body or away from this body, our goal is, on earth is to please him of heaven. Amen. And number four, last, we will all give an account to God for how we live. Romans 14. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. You're going to give account for you, I'm going to give account for me. Let me ask you a question. Look me in the eye, church. If you're part of this church, are you doing your part? Are you showing up faithful? Are you one of those that's, well, you know, I just don't like that. So what? Grow up a little bit here and do things anyway that are helpful. Can I hear an amen? It's not about your satisfaction. It's not about your gratification. It's about doing kingdom work even when it's inconvenient. If, if you have that attitude, boy, how many of you would appreciate the pastor? You know what? I'm just going to quit you guys. I love you, but man, this is just too hard. It's not for my comfort. You know, I, it just don't make me happy. How many of you like a preacher that does that? That don't make any sense, does it? You've got to have some stick to it to you. I know that's not in the dictionary. It's just a Curtis word. So why do you <laughs> say it enough now put it in there? Why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. It's the Bema word in the, in the Greek. You'll stand before God and give account for your performance on earth. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord. In other words, God says, in agreement with my eternal existence, every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess and give praise to God. I can't wait for that day. Even Pharaoh, Hitler, Capone, 
Ahmadinejad, yeah, Kim, uh, Putin, can I get an amen? Yeah, Jesus is Lord, and all the church is going to go, glory, <laughs> yeah. Good to hear all that, amen. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Last verse. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. This is just a correlating verse with Romans 14, and give that for your notes. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So, how is your future shaping up? Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? And finally, what on earth are you doing? For heaven's sake, bow your heads.